beautiful to watch that film again after a, a long time and such a reminder that our children are so incredible. Um, and so are we. But the difference is they do such incredible things and they have so much fun. Um, I don't know if you saw uh, the moving the, the tree trunk, which is such an incredible feat, but the joy as they did it as well. So it's a beautiful way to be introduced. I also wanted to start with a lot of gratitude. Um, I don't know the people in the room, but I have the greatest respect for anyone doing the work of education. And I was with a group of my students two days ago in Bangalore, um, and we vowed that we would use today um, to just express gratitude. So I wanted to start by just saying thank you. I think all of us in our own lives, we do so many tiny, little and big things that are difficult and make a difference. Um, so thank you for that. Um, really happy to be here and have the opportunity to share a little bit of my work. And I wanted to start by telling you that as a, a young girl, I was really fascinated with the circus. Um, and I was especially fascinated with the Barnum and Bailey world famous circus, which was actually called the greatest show on earth. And the reason I was fascinated with the circus is because I believed that when you went to the circus, well, you saw dreams and hope and magic. And then I grew a little bit older and I began to realize that the circus, well, the circus has a dark side. And those animals that you see performing, they're actually not that well treated. And the happy clown, well, he's not that happy. And I've been thinking about that a lot in the last few years and actually linking that analogy to the education system. Because actually, it is the education system that is supposed to be the greatest show on earth. The education system is supposed to literally admit a child into a world of dreams, hope, and magic. And yet, when you look across our country, you realize that for most of our children in this country, it fails to do that. And so a little bit from my 30-year-long journey, so I actually grew up outside of India, and at 18, I dropped out of university in the US, and I came back to Mumbai, and I walked into a, a large urban slum area, and I started teaching. Um, and that single decision changed my life. And for the last 30 years, through setting up Akanksha and then Teach for India, I've really just been asking myself one question. What do children need? And how can we just continuously try to provide them the opportunities to really meet their dreams, hope, and magic? And so I'm going to tell you a little bit today just about three things that I've learned uh, on my journey, and I'm going to tell this to you through a very recent experiment that I've been uh, doing over the years, even though I do many things that I don't like so much, strategy, fundraising, many people in this room probably have similar, um, similar jobs, but for me, the most important thing is staying close to children. And so about a year ago, um, this little boy on the right-hand side came to me, and he said, Didi, he said, I have a big dream. And I said, okay, Rohit, what's your dream? And he said, my dream is that I have a small theater company, and one day I want us to perform in front of 60,000 people at the Wembley Stadium. And so I was a little taken aback, and I, I said, wow, look at this child's ambition. And this is a child from a low-income community who hasn't had that much exposure. So I started talking to this group of children that had come together because they really wanted to raise their voices and be heard. And as I sat with these children in this photograph, I heard the story of Mahesh, 
um, the little boy in the front, who his whole life has been bullied because he's very small. And I heard the story of Gauri, who broke down because she's worried about her father insisting that she drops out of college to get married. And I heard the story of Kushi, who has moved from a low-income school into a higher-income school and is so unhappy because she feels there is no choice and autonomy. And I heard the story of Rohit, who said, while I have this dream of performing at Wembley Stadium, my mother is very ill, and how Didi, do I choose between my mother and my dreams? And as we sat and we literally just created in a circle a space for our kids to share, I realized it's not the exception. Every one of our kids struggles so much to be able to learn. And so as we shared, we realized a very powerful thing that as you share, you become a little bit lighter. And as you share, you enable somebody else to share back. And that's really powerful. And so along with our kids, um, we mustered up the, co the courage to say, can we tell the world our stories? And so we put together um, our own circus. And we called it the greatest show on earth, like the original circus of my childhood dreams. And we said in our circus, can we choose characters to tell our story through? So the same little Mahesh I told you about, you see him now on the left. His story of bullying, he chose to tell through a happy and a sad clown. Why? Because he's always shown the world that he's happy, but inside, he's been sad. And I remember out of everything he said, the one thing that struck me was he said, Didi, I'm terrified of the question, how old are you? Because he's in the 12th standard, and he looks like a little boy. And my Shambhu, who actually dropped out of the school system when we met him, because his sister did very well, and she went ahead and got all the encouragement, and he was constantly compared to her. And in the end, he couldn't take it, and he dropped out of the system. So we chose to depict that through literally a ladder. What does it take to get kids to keep climbing up a ladder? And Vivek, who told us his story, where for eight years his teacher put chili powder in his eyes, poured burning wax on him, and he was too scared to say anything to anyone. And so our kids got together, and I'm going to show you a short one-minute clip of the show, which we did just a few weeks ago on September 4th. So the kids talked about, thank you, 
talked about bullying and competition and rote learning. And the interesting thing was at the end, the little boy says, the show can change, the show must change. That yes, many kids have dealt with it, they've gone through it, they've put up with it. And so in some ways, we have normalized the issues in the system. But what does it take for us to change the system? So why did I tell you all of this? Not to remind you to, to go to the circus the next time it's in town, um, and not to tell you that the solution to what we need to do is to do uh, performances, but really to share three things uh, with you. The first, how do we create for all of our children safe spaces where they can say what they feel, where they can be who they want to be. Secondly, how do we, and Sir introduced um, me in this way as well, it was a beautiful idea, like what does it mean for kids and educators to be partners in this journey? And third, how can kids, irrespective of how old they are, actually drive change in the world, not in the future, but today. So let's look at each of those three things. Safe spaces, how do we do it? The hard thing is we have to be vulnerable and open as adults if we want our kids to open up. And this was my big learning that it's really hard to sit in a circle with children and actually be yourself with all the good in each one of us and with all the messiness and the not so good in each one of us. But I found that this is the most foundational thing, that without feeling safe, our kids are not able to really learn. Kids and educators as partners, I mentioned that two days ago I was in Bangalore with a group of our children and we had an equal number of kids and educators come together for three days to do everything together. So they stayed together, they did games together, they did activities together, they reimagined education together. And one of our students who came, um, he's from Delhi Public School, um, he said at the end he stood up with sort of bright eyes, shy, introverted boy on day one. Day three he stands up and he says, I didn't know that where teachers and students can come together, magic can happen. You know, why can't school feel like this? Um, and I thought that was really beautiful. So this idea is about at every level of the system, what does it mean for our kids to be our partners? Can they ho help us co-plan, co-execute in classrooms? At the policy level, can they sit with our policy makers? At the school level, can they be part of our school management committees? Can they be there because ultimately what we do is for them? And yet we don't ask them, why do you want to learn? What do you want to learn? How do you want to learn? We think we know best. Right? And finally, kids as change makers, and I wanted to share one story of my, one of my biggest role models. This is 12-year-old Rehan, one of our students in Ahmedabad, who lives in a really, really difficult community um, which literally is in the middle of eight mountains of garbage. This 12-year-old today is running 15 community centers in his community. Each community center is facilitated by a 10-year-old student. He's got organic farming happening now in the community, and he has lobbied the Ahmedabad Municipal Corporation to commit to removing that garbage. He's 12 years old. And actually, it wasn't very much that got him to do that. It was just giving him the permission and the love and the belief to say, you don't need to drive change when you're 25 years old or 50 years old. You can care about things that bother you today, and you can drive the greatest learning and the most leadership through doing that today. So um, when we do these three things, safe spaces, partnership, change making, 
an incredible thing happens because we go from being really overwhelmed, right? India has 320 million children. And so for all of us, we feel, oh my gosh, the problem is so big. It's so overwhelming. There are so many children. But we change the paradigm to say, actually, we have 320 million partners in our work. Everything shifts when we think of that, right? We go from this image, which is the traditional image that we see where a teacher is responsible for the learning of a class, to this image where kids and an educator are sitting together. And if the teacher has a problem, the teacher's bringing that problem to class and saying, kids, let's figure this out together. Right? And at a school level with all the school problems, and why? Because kids have this idealism, this joy. They want to help us. They want to be heard, and they want to be our partners. So three things, and one last really, really important thing that has defined my life for the last 10 years. If we are to get a really excellent education, not just exams to pass school to go to college, but a truly holistic education that unleashes the potential of every child. If we are to get that to every single child in the country, then we need an army of people who believe in these things. And so what I've done for the last 10 years is just tried to find those people. People like Juhi in Mumbai, who was a, a graduate from a top college, or closer to here, Avantika, you may recognize her. She's a, an anchor on uh, India Today, who had spent 10 years um, as a news anchor and then joined Teach for India. We find all of these people who have this belief that we can change education. And we ask them to teach full time in a classroom for two years. And this is an incredible picture because Avantika sent this to me recently. She taught in the fellowship in 2010. Those were her children. And I'll tell you a quick story about her. And this is the picture she took now, nine years later of where her kids are. When she started teaching her class, she came to me crying. She said, you fooled us. She said, the gap is so big, it cannot be bridged. My kids are in grade two. They are not able to write one letter correctly. They are not able to sit on benches. And 18 months later, I walked into her classroom and I saw, you all must have seen this, right? Kids sitting on the edge of their seats, almost like they're so excited they're going to fall off their seats, right? They were in grade three and they were reading the unabridged version of Oliver Twist. And I remember with my colleagues sort of pinching her and saying, what grade level text is the unabridged version of Oliver Twist? And it turns out it's a grade six text. That's the amount of learning that they had had in 18 months. And that's not a story about reading and writing. That's a story about dreams and hard work and belief. And so, like Avantika and Juhi, we have a thousand people across the country teaching right now, people who never thought that they would have been teachers. And they're not just teaching, but they're saying, how do I listen to the stories of a Mahesh and of a Vivek, and how do I give them the opportunities to fundamentally transform their lives? And then, after two years of teaching, our goal is to keep them in the education sector at all levels. So here's a quick snapshot of the 3,000 people who remain today in the education sector. People like Roy and Chandani, who not far from here run a school called the Simple Education Foundation, where they work with the Delhi government to transform schools. And I was there a week ago in one of their schools, and I had goosebumps because the school was fundamentally different, and every teacher was doing so many incredible things in that school. 
people like Aniket, who started a program called Hak Darshak, which is saying like there are so many government schemes available, and yet our people don't know them. So can I take that information to the most remote parts of India? People like Safdar, who has just released his first feature film starring a street child from Kolkata, and it's making its rounds in the, in the festival. So these are all people who taught at Teach for India for two years, who grew as leaders through that experience, and who are now working for kids in different ways. People like Ashish, again, a huge inspiration to me, who lives in Sukma district in Chhattisgarh, very difficult Naxalite area, and is working relentlessly to say, what kind of education do the children here actually need? He's been there for the last eight years. People like Anurag, who today leads Delhi government's work on child protection and is fighting to say that until we treat our children better in every single school and there is no abuse and no humiliation, nothing will shift. And so this is what I, I wanted to leave you with, that really we need people, all of us, to believe in dreams, in hope, and in magic. And why? Well, because we need to make it the greatest show on earth. But why more fundamentally? Because our constitution said that every one of us deserves justice, liberty, equality, fraternity. And until we do that, well, our work is not yet done. Thank you. Thank you.